Welcome back to the Bitcoin Layer. I'm Nick Batia. Today, we welcome Craig Shapiro. He writes the Three Circle Investments letter on Substack. He has decades of trading experience, and we welcome him today to talk global macro. Thanks, Craig, Nick. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. So I saw what you're you're working on on your Substack. I'm very interested to hear your thoughts on the dollar. Is the dollar losing its global reserve status? Is it fading at the margin? What is your opinion? And perhaps you can start a little bit with your background and where you yeah, are today. Good. Um, so I've been trading uh, financial markets for the last 20 or so years. I've worked at a variety of very big hedge funds, uh, including Point72, Osprey Management, Graticule, uh, Macro Fund. And I had my own fund called Circle Lane Capital uh, a few years ago. And more recently, I've just been really just trading my own uh, family office and, and for myself. And so, um, you know, in addition to that, I've also uh, been writing a bit more and just trying to get my thoughts out on paper. It helps my investment process. So I uh, started a Substack, been a little bit more active on Twitter and provide some, you know, consulting like services to retail and to some institutional folks as well. So, um, yeah, look, the, the, the story that I've been trying to piece together lately is just about the dollar dollar hegemony and you know what the the treasury and fed have been doing to the dollar and, and you know it dates back you know forever you know from uh bretton woods and post bretton woods and you know what have we done but but really i think the story kicks off in the early part of you know 2022 when russia attacked the ukraine um and you know i kind of got into some details about why i thought that was more than just um you know attacking ukraine it was really an attack on on the dollar and attack on dollar hegemony and that the the, the East has become uh, more annoyed and more upset with the way that the U.S. has run dollar policy, has run its deficits um, and has run, uh, you know, the way it thinks about sanctioning its, its enemies. And so just a lot of a lot of stuff going on um, there. And, you know, look, I mean, the, the U.S. government runs budget deficits for uh, as big and as far as the eye can see. Um, you know, the, the CBO has forecasts of the debt levels in America, you know, reaching 50 trillion over the course of the next couple of decades. Uh, we're running five, 6% deficits uh, of GDP now with full employment and, you know, uh, inflation that's running above 2%. And so there's really doesn't seem to be any, uh, you know, any will or any hope that that Congress is going to address this with either tax cuts or um, tax tax hikes or spending cuts. And so what are what are foreigners going to do um, and how are we going to fund these deficits? And so I've just been trying to piece the crumbs together uh, about whether or not this this story of dollar hegemony, uh, you know, will will continue uh, into the future. And so that that's what I've been writing about uh, a bit more. You know lately the bitcoin layer is sponsored by river make sure to check out river.com today or the link below in the description river is our preferred place to purchase bitcoin now when you're buying bitcoin guys there are several considerations number one should i be using an exchange is the exchange custodying their own bitcoin is the exchange using platforms to custody that we don't know is the exchange leveraging its Bitcoin for other purposes? Well, with River, we know that River does not use leverage of any kind. River also uses its own multi-sig solution so that your Bitcoin are not held by anybody else. So it's a very important thing to understand about what River offers. Now, River also has Lightning Network integration and a lot of other really exciting features. Go check out river.com today. And so let's let's introduce now the Chinese yuan and gold, two of the alternatives to the dollar on a potential long-term horizon. So at the Bitcoin layer, we have for a long time now talked about the unlikelihood of the Chinese one taking over any dominant global reserve currency status. We've also identified gold as not necessarily uh, the, center, the center of the future financial system. So I wonder how you approach the Chinese yeah. one and gold as we think about 
the future yeah, of the dollar. I think the, the replacement for the U.S. dollar in trading is just going to be more uh, local currency trading, more, more multilateral trading regime where com- countries are trading with each other in local currency and settling excess trade balances in gold. Um, so it's not that there's going to be a replacement to the dollar in in, in in global commerce, it's just that it's going to be more the case that more countries are just trading away from dollars over time. And really, this has been accelerated by what China has been doing with oil trading. Um, and I think that that's a key. Obviously, oil trading is, you know, amongst the largest, um, you know, flows in, of trade in the world between, you know, OPEC and China and OPEC and the rest of the world. We're talking about, you know, call it 90, 100 million barrels a day of oil that gets traded. And so these are huge numbers. Um, and and the the petrodollar system was built on the idea that OPEC would sell oil in dollars basically forever and settle those excess trade balances into U.S. Treasuries, and that's been a flow that's allowed the U.S. to run its fiscal deficits, uh, you know, basically forever. And so, uh, but finally, what we've seen, and the other thing too is we we've actually in America we've gone to wars uh, in order to prevent. Uh, other countries from pricing that commodity trade in other currencies, whether it be your, I mean, the Iraq war, um, you know, really, uh, you know, a good part of that was because Saddam wanted to sell oil in euros and Euro and the, uh, was making a, a run at, at a potential, you know, uh, reserve currency replacement for the U S and that was something that was seen as, is not acceptable to the powers that be in America. And so we went to war for that. And so look, China, um, over the last 15 years has talked pretty explicitly about not enjoying the fact that the U S uh, prices all commodities or, or desires to price all commodities in dollars. Doesn't like that U S fiscal and monetary policy uh, kind of sets the, the value of the dollar and the rest of the world has to deal with that, that reality. And so as China has grown as, a, as an export power it has clearly been able to, uh, you know, exert more more power in its negotiations with OPEC and with and with Russia, and so has really moved into I think the beginning in it was 2017, kind of created the Shanghai Oil Contract, and and which is in RMB, and has more recently kind of increased that flow of buying oil in RMB from OPEC, from Russia, from Iran, and you know, really from anybody that will sell to them uh, away from away from U.S. dollars, and that that flow accelerated. After, you know, the the Russia attack of Ukraine, where, um, you know, as the West started to sanction the you know, Russia, you know, more and, and wasn't buying oil from Russia, China basically was able to kind of come in there, buy discounted barrels from Russia in RMB and has settled those excess reserve balances in gold. And so they're they're creating an alternative financial system away from the U.S. dollar. And so the question is. Um, you know, how does this how does this transpire? What happens to this over time? And I think another key da- data point or, or time point on this this uh, this timeline was last August um, at that BRICS meeting. Um, basically, end of August, uh, BRICS got together and you know talked about bringing new countries in. And there had been some chatter about, well, this is the time that BRICS is going to introduce some new currency. Um, and, and the reality, it was a uh, it was a nothing done. And so there was some you know. Not that it was mocking, but it was just a, well, see, the dollar is always going to be uh, the, the, the global reserve currency. BRICS couldn't do anything about it. And really what, what happened, I think, kind of under the surface was, was actually quite instrumental to accelerating you know, the process of transitioning away from dollar and away from U.S. Treasuries as a neutral reserve asset. Basically, BRICS brought into BRICS Saudi, UAE and Iran. Kind of really is now, you know, through that entity now controls the oil flows out of the entirety of OPEC and in the mid and in the Middle East. Um, and so it seems like what happened in in August into September is that the BRICS countries kind of collectively kind of drove up the oil price, drove up the U.S. Treasury selling because when oil prices rise in dollar terms, those energy importing countries like Europe or Japan have to sell U.S. treasuries in order to raise dollars to buy more expensive oil. And so you had this dynamic in the fall of 2023 where oil prices were rising, bond prices were selling off, yields were moving higher, the dollar was rallying. 
which created this kind of virtuous circle of higher yields, higher dollar, higher oil, leads to higher yields, leads to higher dollar. So much so that we had 10 year yields above 5% and 30 year yields above 5% in October. And that really kind of forced a Fed and Treasury pivot. And so it almost looked when you step back, it almost looks like a coordinated attack in that, you know, these countries are basically putting to the US and saying, we're, we're tired of the games, we're tired of the dollar debasement, we're tired of the deficits, and we're tired of being forced to trade global commodities and dollars. And we're creating an alternative system around it. So as I started to connect the dots and put the crumbs together, that's that's the type of analysis and, and writing that I've been doing and trying to explore that and kind of test that and see, you know, does that make sense? And, you know, ha have things really changed? And I think what we're seeing more recently with, with the move in gold is that it does appear like this alternative multilateral system is underway. I mean, we have gold breaking out to all time highs in dollars and in every other currency. You have gold flows moving from the West to the East, which makes sense because oil purchases of gold in the East are, are cheaper than they are in the West. And so China can import gold, buy discounted energy, settle those balances either in goods or in gold. And so, it, it, when you start to when you step back, you, you look and you say this system is really all is, is moving into place, and BRICS and the East are kind of bringing more countries into the fold. And for the U.S., the question will be: Well, who's going to finance our deficits if foreign demand for U.S. Treasuries continues to decline over time? Right. This is not a it's going to happen tomorrow type thing, but this is a every day goes by, there's a little bit less foreign demand for U.S. Treasuries, which makes it a little bit more expensive for the U.S. government to finance its debts. What does that mean for America? What does it mean for the dollar? What does it mean for growth? I mean, these are the, you know, the, I think these are the things that we're exploring right now and dealing with. There's so much to unpack. So I want to talk to you about the Plaza Accord and draw some inference from history. What happened in the 80s in the, in the Plaza Accord and how does how does right now, how do you draw on the Plaza Accord for an analysis today? I want to talk about that shortly. We should also mention that Craig is a Bitcoiner. He's thinking about markets from this lens that he's describing. And one of his conclusions is to be long Bitcoin. And we, we, can, we can touch on that later, but I wanted to give the audience context there because it's important to talk about neutral assets and you can respond there. But I want to start with the shape of the treasury yield curve. And specifically, if the curve is inverted as it is now from the policy rate out to the long end, not as much right now as it was, what is the signal that you take from last year's deeply inverted yield curve, this year's steepening but still inverted yield curve? Maybe you can talk about yield curve control and any expectations you have on treasuries because you're what you're talking about is a transition away from the petrodollar system which involves a foreign bid a structural foreign bid for treasuries with that removed what happens to the treasury market but what i observe is that the curve is still inverted meaning there is still some premium on long-term treasury debt relative to at least the time value of money in dollar land so what yeah, I think it's interesting, there? like when you replay the clock from last year, kind of how the year went and how Treasury and Yellen reacted to a variety of, you know, the price signals from the curve and from term premiums. I mean, basically what you had in the first half of the year is because of the debt ceiling dynamics that were in place, the Treasury was forced to run down the TGA uh, almost to zero, which basically meant that Treasury was not issuing any new net new securities of bills or duration. They just weren't allowed to. We had hit the we'd hit the cap. Congress was dealing with the the song and dance and the dynamic about the faults. And so Treasury had to basically run down cash and nearly got it to to zero. I think we were down we were certainly were, were sub 50 billion, maybe as low as 25 billion uh, before a, a settlement was kind of reached. I think it was June 1st or, or, or June 2nd. And then so subsequent to that, Treasury then went on a, a massive bills selling mission to uh, restock the TGA, which which made a lot of sense. And, but you would say, why is Treasury issuing at the short end of the curve where rates are five, you know, at that point were 5% as opposed to raising in the back where yields were 4%, right? We had a, an, inver we've had an inverted curve for, for, for years. 
Um, and we also had term premiums, which were negative. So why is Treasury not issuing long duration paper during that period of time? And I think, you know, the reason was that they, they've been concerned about liquidity out in the in the back end of the curve. There really is a lack of true incremental demand for 10 and 20 and 30 year paper, given the deficits, given the debasement, given the, the dysfunction in D.C. And so Treasury has kind of been been slow to uh, issue duration securities, so slow that they've actually violated what's been a longstanding tradition of having 15 to 20 percent of total debt outstanding be in bills. Right. They violated that that principle. Uh, and we are not in exogenous times. Right. We, COVID is over. We, we are in, you know, we were at full employment. Like, why is Treasury not issuing out there? And so they've taken the bills percentage above 20 percent for, you know, hard to hard to really understand why. So what happened in, in in August at the or at the beginning of August at the August quarterly refunding announcement, Yellen came out and said, OK, it's time for us to raise some more duration securities because, you know, we, we've said we're going to do that. Subsequent to that, what happened? Term premiums rose, yields, ra- yields went higher, bonds sold off, stocks sold off, and we were in a, a significantly poor risk-taking environment. So poor that it actually started to t- f- tighten financial conditions in such a way that the Fed actually said, well, maybe now the, the long end is starting to do some of the work for us and maybe we don't have to tighten as much. And that created you know, this, this pivot dynamic that happened at the October meeting and certainly in the December meeting. But subsequent to that, in, in late October, early November, when Yellen had another decision to make about the, the composition of issuance, she said, you know what, even though I know I need to raise more duration, I'm actually not going to do it. And so she she pivoted, right? She basically had been signaling that the, that the government needs to issue more on the long end. She said, eh, I don't know. I'm a little concerned here. And what happened? She created, she helped kick off a, a very significant, you know, year-end rally, loosening of financial conditions, aided by the Fed, which removed its last rate hike. Uh, and so, you know, we created this, this great environment for risk into the end of the year. And that, that continued into the beginning of the year. Um, and what happened in January and early February is Yellen said, OK, risk is a little bit calmer now. I'm going to issue duration again. And so subsequent to that February 1st announcement, what we've seen since then is term premiums are starting to move higher again. Yields are moving higher. Uh, so far, risk assets are, you know, still generally bid. I think there's some some view there because of the Fed that maybe we're not going to you know, get back to 2% inflation. We could talk about that. But but that's how Treasury has been reacting, right? There is a concern at Treasury that they can't issue too much long-term paper. And so Yellen is, is kind of playing the market uh, a little bit here, you know, um, issuing long when she feels like she can, pulling it back when she feels like she can't, which I guess as a trader kind of makes sense. You know, if you're the government, you know, you have a lot to sell. Uh, you try to you know, do it, you know, not all at once and you try to piece it in over time. But but look, I think that is the the signal from from the curve and from in and from term premiums is that truthfully, in light of inverted yield curve, in light of still very low term premiums, the US should be issuing out the curve as much as they can. But they are concerned that when they announce that they're gonna come out with even more duration issuance, that no one's gonna show up or certainly not show up at the prices and at the yields that they want. So I think that is the dynamic uh, that is in play. And, and Treasury has said in, in their November uh, TBAC meeting, they, there was a slide that they put in there about this lack of foreign demand. Treasury knows the foreigners are not showing up and will will continue to not show up, particularly because we've decided to uh, expropriate reserves from enemy countries, but also because we have no real ability to slow down the, the deficit creation. Uh, so I think that's the that's the environment that that we sit in right now with respect to the curve and how, how Treasury is thinking about things. I want viewers to to hear what Craig said. This is one of the best and most comprehensive answers that we've had to the question, why is the curve still inverted despite what is going on? Craig is suggesting that if Yellen were to have hit the market with a pro rata supply across the curve based off where they have historically been, the curve would be much steeper than where it is today. 
and that they are worried about this type of dynamic when they come to issue. So we have consistently covered the quarterly refunding announcement announcements at the Bitcoin layer. Uh, th this is this is why because the quantity that they hit the market with in each part of the curve does contribute to the shape of the curve and that term premium that we're talking about. Term premium is a fancy uh, model for something resembling how that shape of the curve compensates you based on how far you go out the curve. So uh, Craig, I think it's a it's an excellent analysis and I appreciate that very much. Um, talk to us about the Plaza Accord now and how do you think about what happened in the mid 80s versus what's happening today? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's you know, I've just been trying to do more reading, you know, being a student of, of history and of markets, just trying to understand, you know, comparable periods or comparable setups. Um, and, and it seems like we have just an interesting, you know, development here with how the U.S. Um, dollar has been strengthening against other fiat currencies, uh, including China, including the RMB. Um, and China's trade surpluses are basically back to, I, I think, record, you know, record highs. Um, and so clearly the U.S. has become increasingly concerned about China's trade, uh, China dumping goods, uh, a, a current, an exchange rate that is too weak. Um, and so what can the U.S. really do about it? And so there is a you know, look, I mean, I think if I went back to the the mid 80s, there was a very similar dynamic in play where the U.S. had been running big fiscal deficits under Reagan. Um, the dollar had been firm um, because of Volcker, you know, Volcker policies that, that had been in place to slay inflation earlier in the decade. And West Germany and Japan were running significant trade surpluses. Um, and so the U.S. was trying to to figure out a way to weaken the dollar to help us balance the economy and, and support our export markets because our manufacturing base was getting hollowed out. And auto companies were complaining about Japanese imports in, of cars and German imports of cars into America. And so in early uh, early 1985, there was discussions at the highest levels of Treasury and at State Department between Germany, uh, Japan, and the U.S. about a, con a coordinated effort to weaken the dollar um, in order to help improve those trade balances for the U.S., in order to help stimulate demand uh, in, in Germany and in Japan, which had, you know, had not been doing much on the domestic demand front. And so just kind of think well, it's a very similar setup right now. I mean, at that, you know, back then, though, you had Germany and um, Japan were at least U.S. allies. Right. So we had this ability uh, to allies talking to allies about creating, you know, a properly uh, traded global uh, structure. Now you have, you know, an enemy, uh, the biggest trading, uh, you know, uh, country in the world, China, and you're trying to convince them to weaken uh, to allow the dollar to weaken, have China stimulate domestic demand uh, and stop dumping goods. And I think it's a very, you know, interesting uh, setup. So Yellen was in uh, China at the end of last week and into this week um, and went there with, I think, a message to try to convince them uh, to to strengthen the RMB, to help a coordinated effort to weaken the dollar. Um, the, the, the question I have is, well, what can we really what could we really offer China at this point? I mean, I think there are some people in certainly in financial uh, media that, that think, you know, China needs to devalue. Uh, China's having major issues with its property market. China's about to roll over and, and you know, have a, a great property uh, driven implosion. But you step back, China's trade balances are at record surplus. And the reason that they are is because they're buying discounted energy from Russia, from Iran. And so they're they're just out competing, uh, you know, Germany, Europe, Korea, Japan, who can't buy these discounted Russian energy sources. And so Yellen's going there and trying to tell them to strengthen the arm, you know, the R and D. And they're thinking, well, wh why do we need to do that? I mean, so it's not clear to me exactly why China would agree to a coordinated message of trying to weaken the dollar. The only thing I think that we really could offer is this new 
financial system with gold back at the center, right? It's, it's kind of ties back into eliminating dollar hegemony, eliminating U.S. Treasury hegemony as the global, lead, the global neutral reserve asset. It's reintroducing gold because China owns a lot of gold, right? And China's ability to use its gold to buy energy, to buy commodities, to buy imports, um, and to have its trading partners settle excess balances in gold creates this virtuous cycle uh, where China can continue to take share from you know the, the the rest of the world and China's power could continue to grow at the at the expense of the US's. And so I just think it's a very interesting dynamic in play. I mean we'll see, you know, that some people have speculated that you know the Xi Biden meetings in San Francisco kind of kicked off some sort of uh, at last year kicked off some sort of new trading regime and that Yellen is kind of was there this week to try to keep moving that forward. I mean, we'll see over the course of the next uh, few months. I don't know if they're going to specifically announce, you know, anything, but I think the direction of travel is known, right? Gold is moving into an increased share uh, as a neutral reserve asset. Gold flows are moving to the east, uh, whether it's China or India, and gold is replacing U.S. Treasuries as a neutral reserve assets, which has those implications for, you know, the U.S. as we as we move forward. Now, can I just clarify with you? on the on the front of the united states being okay with the gold settlement for trade imbalances if the dollar were to weaken relative to the one is that the trade off that you're saying the us would be okay with can you yeah look i think i think the us is looking to be able to improve i think stepping back the us realizes post covid post this Russia-Ukraine war, that our supply chains, our manufacturing capabilities in America are basically a disaster, right? I mean, we're relying on China for all healthcare equipment and for, and for military equipment, you know, for a lot of crucial parts for military equipment. Um, we need to rebuild the U.S. manufacturing base. We need to rebuild U.S. infrastructure. Um, we need to just rebuild America. The only way that we're going to be able to do that and be competitive on a global scale is with a much weaker dollar. And so how do we transition the world from one of where the dollar, you know, was allowed to do whatever it was doing because the US was this hegemonic power running massive deficits to one where now the US is going to actively be looking to grow its ex you know, grow its supply chain, grow its exports again. And so yeah, I think the US wants to have a weaker dollar against the RMB and against basically everybody else in order so that we could become more competitive and rebuild those domestic uh, supply chain capabilities. I'm just not sure that China is willing to, you know, roll over and, and, and allow that. What, are, what can we give China in return? And I think allowing gold to move into a, a, a in, enhanced status uh, as a reserve asset I think really goes a long way to giving China what they're trying to do. Now, the, what the U.S. will not tolerate, I don't believe, is the settlement of excess trade reserves in government bonds of China. Right? They don't want China, OPEC or they don't want Saudi selling oil to China and recycling those uh, balance, you know, those excess reserves into Chinese government bonds because then China can go and really stock up its military capabilities and go. So, so the U.S. is not really willing to accept that as an outcome. And let's be clear, the U.S. still has a pretty uh, renowned military, right? We still have, we're still a, a big, um, you know, military player in the world. So we do have some ability to kind of dictate how we would like this to go down. So I think we are willing to accept a world where gold is reintroduced as a neutral reserve asset and excess balances are settled in gold as opposed to in Chinese government securities. Um, so, yeah, I think that's the that's the dynamic. And truthfully, would, would anyone really blink an eye if gold was four thousand an ounce or eight thousand an ounce? I don't think that the world it would, would really miss the people. What it would do, it would allow the U.S. to to de you know to delever its balance sheet in a very big way. The U.S. owns a lot of gold that's marked at old prices. It could go a long way to, you know, reducing its deficits by that gold revaluation, which can kind of, you know, create this this further virtuous circle for the U.S. where it's not, um, you know, suffering under the the weight of the debt to GDP ratios. So there are some there are a lot of benefits to a world that has gold being reintroduced 
uh, as a neutral reserve asset. So I think we are moving on that pathway. Are we? Are, are there you know efforts in the U.S. Uh, deep state that will push back against that? I'm sure, right? No one's really willing to just kind of lay you know uh, roll over and and give this hegemonic uh, authority and power away. But I think we are moving increasingly in that direction. And I think the evidence of that would be things like gold breaking out to highs, gold flows moving to, um, you know, uh, to the east, trade between China and UAE, trade between China and, and Saudi, you know, growing uh, in local in local currency terms. Those are the signals that you'd be looking for to say this system is accelerating uh, its pace. So this is this is definitely the geopolitical discussion we've been looking for, Craig. Uh, I want to flesh out your theory toward the tail end of it, because, and and by the way, the market. You're a trader, so I'm sure that you believe in this adage that we always use, which is "price is truth." The gold breakout right now is sending an extremely loud signal. There's something categorically happening right now in the Q1, Q2, 2024 to gold and the international monetary system. That is categorically occurring. And what you're trying to do as well as us is diagnose that with the context throughout. So toward the end of this theory here, so let's say, let's pretend that the US is okay with slightly more gold settlement in international imbalances because the alternative would be Chinese government bonds. So financing the government to potentially build up the Chinese military. That's something that we as Americans would prefer the, the gold solution rather than the government bond solution. So we hear you there. Now in the gold to settle imbalances, that means not treasuries. So then who is the buyer, the ultimate buyer of treasuries, and how do you? And then how do you see that part of it? Yeah, I mean, so I think it's fair to say that over time, we're going to have way less foreign demand for treasuries. And actually, you know, kind of thinking back, we have, like I mentioned earlier, the U.S. again went to war to prevent countries from buying commodities and currencies other than dollars. Now it's almost. In a way, we are. It's become in our strategic interest to force company countries to buy commodities away from U.S. dollars. And the reason we want to do that is because we don't want our allies, Japan and Europe and others, in a situation where they're being forced to sell their U.S. treasuries in order to pay up for more expensive energy or more commodities. Right? I mean, we have our, these deficits. We know the foreign demand is declining if our allies are contributing to that supply by being forced to sell down treasuries then we're really in a in, in a problem because treasury has a lot to sell and then the foreigners have a lot to sell and who's going to buy if the fed's not buying so that's a i think it's we've, we've shifted now to the u.s understanding that it would be better for even our allies japan and europe to start buying their own energy in in euros or in yen now that's speculation, but I think ultimately we will we will get there because we don't want them to sell down their reserves at a rapid pace while no one else is buying. Now I think with respect to the U.S. deficits, the the logical buyer first will be our U.S. banks, and so there will be reform. Uh, I know you had a I think a, a, pot, a, a, a an episode earlier about SLR reform, so I imagine that's that's coming. Um, where banks are going to be able to buy treasuries without having to put capital up. That was a, a temporary exemption after during COVID that was allowed. I imagine that after we go through the next bond market malaise or dysfunction, that that will be introduced. Uh, and so uh, domestic banks will be able to take on or be forced to take on uh, more of the treasury um, load. And then ultimately, you know, the Fed will be the buyer of last resort at the point in time when, uh, you know, we, we, we need that to happen. I think right now, you know, it's we're not there yet. But part of my my suspicion about Powell's dovishness uh, at the last um, press conference in March had to do with this idea that there are people in the Fed and in government that realize that the Fed needs to help bring down borrowing costs for the U.S. government because that is the only lever really that can be pulled to help lower the deficits, right? I mean, there is no 
appetite in DC for tax hikes. There is no appetite in DC for spending cuts. So how do we move the deficit in any positive direction? The only real way we could do it is to lower interest expense. So that's the Fed cutting rates. And if that has the benefit of taking asset prices higher, that will lead to more capital gains. So that will bring in more tax receipts. That has a positive uh, effect as well. So I think the cynic would say that Powell's dovishness has something to do with, with that dynamic in play in an election year. Um, you know, we'll, we'll see how that plays out as inflation in America remains sticky and the labor market is good and the economy is running better than expected, whether or not the Fed can really engineer that, that cutting cycle. But, but ultimately, in the end, the Fed will be forced to buy the, the, you know, the government debt at the point in time when the, we don't, when the government doesn't like the prices that, it, that, it's, that it's getting. So I don't think we're there yet. The Fed's still doing QT. Um, they may taper that uh, you know, in the next couple of months. But as far as a resumption of QE, that's going to happen. But maybe we're just uh, you know, a, a few quarters away from that, that dynamic being, being put out there again. Yeah, so QE, the eventuality based on the math. So talk to us now about inflation because that is the hurdle. You categorized Jerome Powell as gaslighting the market. So what we can throw a chart up here on financial conditions and how they have trended easier um, of late. How is Jerome Powell gaslighting the markets? What's going on with inflation specifically and are we going to get a cut? Are we going to get a cutting cycle happen, even though inflation is remaining in the current sticky dynamic and not even getting a little bit better from here? Yeah. So I'm curious your thoughts. Yeah, the, the, the Fed has talked about this idea that interest rates can be cut because real rates are elevated. And that because real rates are elevated, financial conditions are, are tight. And they've talked about monetary policy as still being restrictive. But when you look at the variety of financial conditions indicators of which the Fed themselves publishes, right? They've, pub, they, they've announced, uh, they put out two different financial conditions indexes uh, middle of last year to show how restrictive policy is. Well, the, the current updates on that both show that policy is actually not restrictive. Right. So their own data shows how much policy um, or how much uh, loosening financial conditions has done over the course of the last six months since the, the pivot that started at the end of October. If you look at the Chicago uh, Fed's National Financial Conditions Index, it's showing a level of, of accommodation that looks similar to the environment we had before the tightening cycle even began in early 2022. Uh, the, the Goldman Sachs has a financial conditions index also that shows conditions are as loose today as they were in the early part of 2022. So it's clear that financial conditions are loose and yet the Fed continues to say policy is restrictive. There, there's a disconnect there and it's the Fed's myopia on this real rates idea, which I think is blinding them. I mean, clearly the economy is reacting to the looseness in financial conditions over the course of the last few months. All the data is coming in better than expected on growth on the labor market and now on inflation, both on core inflation, uh, which has been stickier. We've seen the super core readings in January and February running, you know, well above target of getting back down to 2%. And now on the headline side, you have gasoline, which is, which is breaking out and seasonally strong. So gasoline prices now are up year on year and are up significantly since the beginning of the year, which is, which is driving an increase in inflation break even yields and inflation expectations. And so what you have is, a market that's saying, the Fed, conditions are too easy. You think they're tight. We're going to keep driving up inflation assets until you become uncomfortable, until we get to a point where you feel like we actually are restrictive again. And based on the speak that we've seen over the course of the last couple of weeks post the March meeting, even the hawks on the Fed, whether it's Bowman or Bostic or Barkin or Waller, they, they've pushed back against Powell's dovishness, but even they're not willing to say that the next move from the Fed could actually be a hike, right? And so the market continues to see a Fed that just wants to, just is going to cut, right? At, at some point, they're going to cut, whether it's in June or September or December. When it, the next move is definitely going to be a cut no matter what. And so the market is, is picking up on that narrative and is taking inflation assets to, to new highs. And I think that will not stop until we 
get to a point where the odds are roughly more imbalanced that the next move for the Fed is a cut or a hike. And we're just not, we're not there yet. And so I suspect that, that that's part of the reason we're seeing breakouts in gold, breakouts in crypto, Bitcoin, meme coins, and then all things, all things equities, right? These are inflation based assets that will continue to rise until the Fed kind of recognizes the mistake that the looseness of financial conditions is not allowing them to get inflation back down to 2%. Craig Shapiro, thank you so much for joining us today. Tell people where they can find your work and give us a, a teaser yeah. for next time. No, absolutely. Talk I'm, about I've become pretty active on Twitter. I'm at, uh, my name is uh, just my initials, uh, CES921. I write a Substack called Three Circle Investments. And I also provide some some consulting for uh, Leduc Trading, where I'm a macro advisor to uh, some of uh, Samantha Leduc's uh, clients. So, um, yeah, I love to uh, love to come back and, and chat uh, more about whether or not these uh, hypotheses that I've had uh, have have, uh, have come true. Appreciate it, Craig, and we'll catch you guys next time. Sounds good. Thanks a lot, Nick. Special thanks to River for sponsoring this channel. Purchase Bitcoin without any fees when you use River's DCA feature. River has become our trusted source of accessing the Bitcoin market because they don't use any third-party custodians. This is a very, very important thing to understand. River is not using another company to store the Bitcoin for them. They have their own multi-signature solutions, which means that they have designed their own way to make sure nobody else has responsibility for the Bitcoin for the time that you have River hold your Bitcoin for you on their platform once you have purchased it. So go check out river.com today. Thanks for sticking with us as always at the Bitcoin layer. Subscribe to our channel. Subscribe to our Substack at the Bitcoin so that you can follow along our latest research and analysis.